we have our first invited speaker of this conference. We have Oren Shaw. Oren is no stranger to PyCon Australia, having already presented twice at our event. She is the founder of Yara and is a DevOps culturalist. So, DevOps. What is DevOps? In 15 words or less, DevOps is the intersection of building software and making it work for people. I invited Oren here because after her groundbreaking article in which she termed the, coined the term contempt culture, she spent the last four years further refining the concept, specifically around the intersection of sociology and tech culture. And with that, please join me in welcoming Oren Shaw to speak. Yay. Thank you very much, Katie. Another round of applause for you all getting to be here today and the wonderful Katie for organizing this wonderful conference. Uh, hi, I'm Oren, and it really is an honor to speak here in front of all of you today. If you want to live tweet this, you can find me at, at Oren on the third, the third longest running internet argument, also known as Twitter. If you're curious, the first two are Usenet and IRC respectively. You may have previously heard me speak on tech culture and how our culture frames everything that we do. As Katie mentioned, I am founder and principal culturalist at IR Limited. Uh, we're based out of Wellington and from DevOps, we naturally do DevOps. Well, oh, that's Wellington, New Zealand. I hear there's a Wellington nearby, Sydney. Uh, what this means is that we work on ensuring the, su the success of technological changes by focusing on the cultural and organizational impact of those changes. And today, I want to talk to you about, well, what do I do? I do DevOps, so I want to talk to you about DevOps, or how to put stuff into prod, and how to not have it catch fire, or really, you know, unless it's supposed to catch fire, in which case, you know, cool, now it catches fire. And this is an easy and non-confrontational topic, right? It'd be really easy to approach this as a technical talk, to talk about deployment engineering, because that's really cool, to talk about migrating to microservices, to talk about containers in your stack and Docker and Rocket, and I hear there's something new as well, which I haven't heard about beyond there's something new as well. I could talk about theory and my personal layer theory of DevOps and deployment and how it impacts how we design production systems. I could talk to you about global transactions and how to think about what microservices imply for distributed transactions, what a transaction even means, what data integrity even means in a microservice environment. And these are all really important architectural and technical questions, really important when it comes to DevOps. But, well, these are all technical conversations. And, well, Who's had that thing where they thought that a new technology was, was the bee's knees and where it would light the world on fire and you were really excited and you fought and fought and there was no traction? You just couldn't get this new technology that you knew, that you knew would solve so many problems into where you worked. Don't look at my feet. <laughs> I can see you. And I've definitely run into this. I've tried to get Postgres into production at various places I've worked, and I've failed. Or SaltStack, which I am a huge fan of, into production where I've worked, and failed. I've tried to get Docker into production, and failed. Or even the cloud. Woo! You can all woo with me. AWS, Azure, Google, anything. I have struggled to get that very first step to happen. And I bet all of you have very similar stories. And I've rationalized this, and I imagine we've all rationalized this in a variety of ways. We talk about how people just won't listen. We use negative epithets to describe others, hostile and dismissive language to respond to those people who just don't agree with us. We treat users like this. We treat our peers like this, our managers, everyone else that we work with. And this isn't a blaming session. Like I'm not blaming you or myself or any of this, but I'm trying to 
represent that this is cultural. It's what we have been taught to do. And so it is what we do do. We, what we feel, the thing that drives this is frustration. I get frustrated at this. I get irritated. I get angry about how this thing, this thing that I know will work and will help, is just being ignored. But as I mentioned, I run IARA. And as a consultant, I get to see a lot of companies in action. And I get to see a lot of how internal cultures have formed and how they operate. And so today, instead of talking to you about some amazing, cool technological work that we do, talking to you about Docker or the cloud or SaltStack or any of these things, I'd like to talk to you about change, about how I've learned to reason about change and how I think we can create lasting change in your organizations. But before I start, I'd like to set some context here. As Katie mentioned, I have this theory called DevOps or called contempt culture. And all of my thoughts and ideas are grounded in this cultural concept of contempt culture. And this is the process by which tech culture encourages us, teaches us to use contemptuous behavior as our means of expressing and generating social capital. My experiences as a developer and as for speaking to the words are hard first thing in the morning, just so you know. My experiences as a developer and working with and speaking to businesses exist within this framework, within this theory. And so with that in mind, this morning I would actually like to talk to you about some things I've learned by talking to your boss or why change is hard and what we can do about it. Contempt culture is our communications culture, and it has been for a very, very long time, from the 1970s with the genesis of the term loser, or the 1980s with the PEBCAC or the ID10 errors, or stories of the BOFH. Don't look this up, it's really gross. Through the 1990s and Eternal September, who's heard of Eternal September? OK, so for those of you who haven't heard of Eternal September, this was the, mo the day that AOL linked to Usenet, and it was a huge cultural clash, and there was a lot of contempt built up around it. The 90s also brought us the birth of PHP and the birth of hating PHP. The early 2000s brought us Rails and the birth of hating Rails. The late 2000s brought us the birth of Node and the birth of hating Node and hating JavaScript. The mid-2010s has brought us amazing front-end developers and amazing front-end tooling and the bleeding edge of technological development and the dripping contempt leveled at people who do their UI work in browsers. We have a culture that lets Linus Torvalds operate for 18 years. We epitomized Linus Torvalds. We said that was good, that toxic cult of personality. This is our ideal. And this is that pervasive, all-important belief that technical skill is all that matters. And I'm not throwing stones at a culture I'm not a part of. I'm not standing on the outside. I was and am a part of this culture. And I can tell a story of that one time I shouted, get a real language into the silence in a crowded meetup with over 100 people there. And how gross I feel a decade later about all the times I have implied and outright stated that anyone who uses PHP is clearly, clearly not very good at being a programmer. I mean, if they were, they wouldn't use PHP, right? Where I still, still struggle to define and describe things in terms of pitfalls and difficulties versus using hostile or contemptuous language. And I'm bringing this up, again, not to make us feel bad. Like, this could be a blame session, but it's really not. I'm bringing this up because this is the idea of a system, a system that we are participating in. And by framing it like that, we can start to understand the behaviors that we're seeing. Without a framework to examine the system, we cannot understand the system. We cannot reason about the system. With a framework, we can start to look at what people are doing why they're doing it, we can start to draw hypotheses. Hypotheses that try to internalize other worldviews. Hypotheses that aren't grounded in, you know, B 
being insulting. And because our communication is primed to be, well, well, deeply unpleasant to outsiders, we need this framework. We need a new set of tools so we can start to ask new questions, like what has pervasive hostility done to our context while we're at our jobs? What is it still doing at our jobs? And these are, these are really important questions to me because any technology, microservices or Docker or CI or hybrid cloud or whatever the latest hotness is today, all of these things exist in a business context, in an organizational context. So what we need to talk about is the things that a business cares about, that your business that you work at cares about. And, well, the business does not care about technology, like at all. And I know, I know technology matters to us. Technology is so cool, so cool, so cool. I got into this whole DevOps thing when I was writing web software, I was writing Python. And I went up to a system and I said, hey, I've written this thing, could you please deploy it? And they sighed loudly, which I deserved, and asked me to write a puppet manifest for it so that they could deploy and monitor and work with it properly. And I said, what, what, is, what is Puppet? And if you've not heard of it, it's a configuration management tool. It's like Ansible or Chef or SaltStack. And it was so cool. Oh, it was so cool. I never, ever touched a tool like this. It's this powerful distributed programming tool. And I love distributed programming. Who loves distributed programming? It's so much fun, isn't it? It's so like, ah, my brain. And, and it forced me to consider orchestration, to consider how systems behaved across disparate components, across an entire set of infrastructure, an entire set of interconnectedness. And this was fascinating. Because I had to consider programming the thing that I had made beyond myself. It was not just my programming. It existed within a larger whole, which led to new questions like, how does this impose costs and dependencies and load on the other parts of the system? How does this impact others? How does it behave in a broader context? Crucially, what did I miss? What new things do I need to think about? So yeah, technology is cool. I love this whole, you know, Lambda function as a service world. I love Terraform, which is the best and worst tool I've ever used. I love SaltStack. I hold it so dearly in my heart. And even as we migrate away from configuration management towards the containerized Docker world, I even got to speak about it at PyCon AU in Brisbane a few years back. It was so great. But what I think is cool what I think is neat, what I'm super excited about, doesn't matter to a business in the slightest. What the business cares about is outcomes. Outcomes like, can I keep the lights on? Can I find people who will pay me nice monies so I can make payroll and you all get to pay your rent? Or the myriad of other things that a business needs to care about. So, who's had that experience where we know, we know a new technology will save a business money, like lots of money, possibly lots and lots of money, where it will reduce workloads, where it will, in the light of what that business cares about, those outcomes, improve them, improve those outcomes, where we know this will happen. And we've been ignored while we're trying to pitch this technology, where we're unable to get people to listen to what we think will help. I've, I've experienced this. What's happening that I have learned is that the business is focusing on predictability. The existing process is known. It can be budgeted for, planned, reasoned about. And that, that is what matters. Knowing I can make payroll next month matters more to me than maybe being able to save money now. So when we talk about technologies, we're not just asking for the time or the cost of that time, the price of exploration and potential failure, but we're asking for the business to abandon no ability, that ability to predict and budget and plan, and that, <clears throat> excuse me, that is a risk. 
And in general, businesses must be very conservative. Risk is what they try to manage. And they're doing this using social tools learned over decades. And if we think about this as part of our broader system, as part of our history under contempt culture, we can see that a communications gap has been created. And this gap, and this is actually hard. It was hard for me to learn. This gap is not the business's fault. Think on what I said earlier, on all the ways our past effects are present. And this is one of those ways. We stand on the shoulders of mistakes, of hostility and misguidance, of harmful behavior, of being taught to express ourselves in contemptuous terms. And as a result, we are not trusted. We are sidelined. We exist solely to be worked around, which anyone in InfoSec could tell you so many stories about. You should ask them. There's probably commentary about that yesterday at the InfoSec panel. But I digress. You will have seen this in action, where we build tools. And we say they're for our, for, we build tools and we're say, we say they're for, our, for ourselves. That is not a good sentence. That they're good enough for us. But these very tools, the tools that we use and we make, encode hostility and contempt. How long has it taken for good tool chains, for doing good open source development to exist on Windows? In many cases, it has taken Microsoft themselves to make open source tooling viable on Windows to the point where they are now the most important open source contributor in the world. Not because it's technically difficult, it's not, but because so many communities hold Windows in such low regard, in such contempt, to the point of considering even the users of Windows to be beneath us, to be barely worth scraping off my shoe. You've seen this in the defensive attitudes that people have when we talk to them, either when you've gone to speak to them or when they've come to speak to you, where we've pushed this cultural ideal of thou shalt come to me that my, thy knowledge is worthless compared to my towering might of computer knowledge. where we've styled ourselves in terms of elitism, like wizard or ninja, ninja developers, or rockstar devs, or, and this is my personal favorite lately, the 10X engineer. <laughs> and by doing these things, we have pushed ourselves to the sidelines. And this is you know, not super great when we wanna talk about the new technologies, the new processes that we know will save time and money or when we need to address unrealistic requests, like the deadline that is three months too short. And as I said, this is not the business's fault. This is our fault. We've done this to ourselves. And you might look back at your own history and say, no, I've not done this. I've not behaved like this. I've never done these things. But that, and this sucks, because that doesn't matter. You benefit and suffer from the actions of people like you that have existed in a history that stretches back decades, a history that has ramifications to this very day, to this very minute. And those ramifications, those histories, affect what we can do today, what we can do from tomorrow onwards. And to touch on what some of those consequences look like, I'd like to bring up an article that I saw in the Intelligencer recently I have ADHD, so time is fragmented into now, recently, and previously. So it happened sometime, I don't know, um, where they were talking to the founder of Delicious after they were acquired by Yahoo. And the specific line that stuck with me from the article was, if you wanted to get hardware, you went to the hardware request committee with your proposal. And they assumed that engineers liked spending money for no reason. So you'd have to go back and present again in two weeks and prove you really needed it. So that's a month gone. 
So what can we learn from this? Well, there's a process for getting hardware. Why? Why is that process in place? How often do we ask why? Well, from the framing the founder of Delicious has offered us here, it's because engineers like spending money for no reason. OK, so why does the business believe that? Why would the business have created a process that believes that? Because this, this is important. This is one of those core things about using that new framework and using that new way of looking at things is this belief isn't arbitrary. It didn't spring from nowhere, like the Greek gods from Titan's head, whose name I've forgotten. Anyway, I digress. This belief isn't arbitrary. It is a consequence. It is a result of past actions that, in the eyes of the business, were risky, unnecessary, too costly. It did not matter that the founder of Delicious had never done those things, never tried to buy unnecessary hardware, was never tried. That also didn't work as a sentence. That he had never tried to do risky things. The history, the context, still affected him, still affected his team. And, and as engineers, we know we care about technology, right? We know. We know, I could describe this scenario to you, and we know, or presume, that it was necessary. So if we think it's necessary, and they don't, then that's on us. We are not communicating effectively. That's on us for not telling them why it's necessary, why it's risky to not have this technology, what benefits it offers. And so when engineers previously had bought stuff, and maybe it didn't work out, and an accountant looked at this graph of unnecessary expenditures, spend that somehow wasn't justified, or you know, maybe someone's bonus was tied to saving money, we end up with this process, this process, this business belief that does not believe in engineers, does not believe engineers. A process that demands a month to ensure that money is not being wasted. And the future had to bear those consequences. And that we think this is harmful. Well, we're operating under a different set of assumptions than the people who designed and implemented this process. And they're not better assumptions or better knowledge. It's just different. And in order to communicate to that to the business why this is risky, why these consequences make it difficult to address future risks, why this process is not solving the problem it's intended to solve, we cannot speak in the language of technology. We cannot speak in our own language. We cannot treat our assumptions as better. We have to speak to the business and do it on the business's terms. And for decades, decades, our culture has taught us that we do not have to do this. It's taught us to consider people that do not hold our kind of technical knowledge as lesser, as ignorant, as inherently less valuable than us. And the consequences of our culture is that we do treat people like that with contempt, with hostility, and now they're used to it from us, which means they are primed to not listen. And to make a change, well, somebody's got to start listening. Change isn't going to magically spring out of thin air. Unlike geese, change does not grow in trees. Yeah, it turns out they, in the 1800s, geese grew in trees. Who knew? And, and this might seem like a small segue, but bear with me. This is important that someone needs to start listening because the business does actually care about technology. And you might be now going, wait, 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 wait. Oren, Oren. <laughs> <laughs> I 
You've just spent the entire first act telling us that technology does not matter to the business. And yes, yes I did. Do you want to get a picture of that? Okay. <laughs> and I was telling the truth. The business doesn't care. But it also does care quite a lot about technology. In the sense of the technology that's currently being used, the status quo and what that implies. Businesses, people in businesses, they don't care about technology like we do. But as I said, they do care about knowability, about being able to have believable estimates. And existing technological choices are knowable. They are an established process. They are defined boundaries. Like that process that I mentioned that believes that engineers just want to buy unnecessary hardware. These processes and status quos arise from experiences that the business has had. And there are attempts to answer the question, well, how do we not think about this again? Or how do we not have that failure happen again? So businesses do care about technology in the sense of, great, problem solved. Good job, team. Hooray. I wish I had a mission accomplished image there. But this isn't the end of the story. This ends in consequences, consequences like change management controls that result in weeks or months to deploy changes, going through a process that we look at and ask, why, why sad noises intensify? That's because of anxiety. It's because a deploy failed, perhaps catastrophically. And it might have been days or weeks to manage a rollback or a roll forward. Weeks where the business was losing money, where something critical, something critical and on the line was not working properly. Or it might be reacting to legislation or regulatory compliance or something happening in the news cycle. Any number of things. Excuse me. But this is the risk that they care about. That's where the technology matters. That's where they care the most. Not newness, but stability, knowability, observable outcomes. And some of those triggering events may not even have happened at your business, at your employer. It may have happened years ago at previous employers. And those people brought their experiences with them. Because no one can be disconnected from their past or from experiences in that past. A new employer, we think of them as a, new, as a clean slate, but they're only partially a clean slate. We may adopt new practices, but we bring our old anxieties. When we do not introspect, we rebuild our, own frame, our old frameworks, passively, implicitly, only sometimes explicitly. And this has consequences, like, well, we all know of the knowledge hoarders, those people who know how the technical system works, why it's the way it is, what to do when it fails. And these are the people that are in the critical path and are enabled and encouraged by this approach to risk management. And these people are often very hostile, a hostility and toxicity that is encouraged and enabled by these approaches to risk management. And I mean, that's not great. I've worked with people like that. And I hated it. They made me feel small and ignorant and useless. It's a difficult feeling. It generates imposter syndrome, reinforces inadequacies. And years later, I still bear those marks. And these people become impediments to change. They're part of that resistance to change, part of that stability, and that conservatism, especially when the changes are major, especially really, really major changes. Like the biggest one since 1991, 89, which was, of course, the birth of the World Wide Web, which is, of course, the cloud. Woo with me again. Woo. The cloud is a fascinating part of the modern computing story. And as someone as deeply into DevOps as I am, it's clear that in many ways, the cloud enabled, truly enabled DevOps on a technical level where we could finally truly experiment and test and refine without needing to go through a cumbersome bureaucratic process to, and re, cumbersome, resistant bureaucratic process, I hate talking sometimes, <laughs> it's hard first thing in the morning, that we all hate. The ones that say we just want to buy hardware for fun, well now it costs 30 cents. Just 
give me the credit card. The cloud is where infrastructure as code became real, where automation could blossom and grow far, far beyond what we had before. The cloud, as we know it, was launched on March 14th, 2006. This is when AWS released S3, SQS, and EC2 to the world. This was actual cloud doing actual cloud things. As of today, that was 13 years, four months, and if my math is correct, 16 days ago. Might be 17. And last year in March, I was speaking to a group of senior tech executives in New Zealand, and I raised this point as well, because the event I was speaking at was about dipping our toes into the cloud, exploring, maybe, maybe just a little bit of exploring this hybrid cloud where we keep a lot of our stuff on prem still in our data centers, because that's safe. 13 years. 13 years. And I'm still just starting to have those conversations. The value of the cloud, the things that it enables, the infra code, the automation, those aren't the questions that need to be answered or addressed because those questions don't matter. Those are the questions that we care about, the technology that we care about. Business doesn't care that we can spin up a new instance in a minute because, because we are bad, very, very bad at communicating how this impacts risk what risks it alters, what risks it removes, what risks it creates, what it costs. Not in the fact that it costs 30 cents in OPEX, but in training, in migration, in what new regulatory needs happen as a result. And all of these changes, well, they're anxiety inducing at the business level. Businesses want stability, they want to manage risk and they don't know because we won't communicate how this change will alter their risk profile. So someone needs to communicate that. Change does not help happen without someone starting to speak. We need to communicate that. But sometimes, sometimes though, a change will start. And we won't have to do anything, but a change will start. Like this whole DevOps thing, it's a major change. And as I've touched on, change is a risk, but somehow the necessity became apparent that a change must happen. Maybe it was harder to hire talent to work on our existing things. Maybe we were losing critical people because they were like, I'm tired of this stuff. I want to go play with the new things over there that were written in the 2000s, not the 1980s. Or maybe it was coming up at industry events and they were getting peer pressure at the executive level, hearing about agile. Yes, companies are still just starting to explore Agile in 2019. I have clients like this. It's, I'm glad they're exploring it. <laughs> but regardless of the trigger, it can and does happen. A change will begin. And then uh, who's been in an environment where change has started and then it has stalled out and failed? I have been there more than once, in fact. And and this is a theme, oh, it's a theme. When it fails, part of the reason is that communications gap that I keep coming back to, the, keep coming back to. Why is this change valuable? What risks at a business level does it change? How, and this is really, really important, this is like the critical thing, how does it alter power dynamics? This is a super important question because power dynamics, the people who will say no, they always dictate whether or not a change can happen. And I have a story about this from a client. And this was a big, staid, conservative organization with release cycles that measured in months. And they wanted to roll Docker out as part of exploring new technology and get it at least a little bit into their deployment pipeline. And they were running into issues with their release manager, the person in charge of making sure releases were not going to break everything. And so there's a process here. We fill out some forms, we submit builds, we let them get qualified, we wait weeks at set er ah. 
And this is the sort of process that results in so many things getting added to the build to maximize the return on that time. And yes, wow, as a technical person, that doesn't that sound risky? <laughs> Lots of stuff is going to break when we chuck everything in all at once, right? The people at this client knew that too. So they were trying to add Docker as part of getting a shorter release cycle to get CI a little bit into their pipeline. But the releases, they're still owned by this manager. And that process still exists. So they could, as I have done many times, gotten frustrated and shouted at the sea. But what they did instead was they sat down with the release manager and they said, hey, what are you concerned about? What matters to you? What are you being judged on? And they weren't rude about it. They weren't condescending. They weren't nice. They were respectful. They cared about the responses. They listened to the responses. They never stopped that person and said, wait, no, you're wrong. How many times have you done that when someone has tried to explain something to you? Me, I've done it heaps. Because they didn't do that because no, you're wrong is part of that condescension, part of that contempt culture, part of that decades long hostility. And then they took that information and they built a demo around that. And they went back and they were like, hey, here's what we can do for you with the new process that, in, that directly impacts the things you're concerned about. And they said, how does this meet your needs? Does this meet your needs? And critically, because we suck at communicating, what did we miss? And the release manager was like, wow, OK, this gives me way more and way better information than I have right now. I am on board with your cool new fancy tech thing. This will reduce risk in many ways that I care about. And that's what we want to enable. That's what all of this is for, to make the lives of others better. Adding Docker wasn't a technology decision. Technology wasn't a driver or a core focus. The focus here was seeing if a technology could solve a problem for someone else. And understanding that the rest of the business had different needs. The Docker was the tool being added isn't the point of the story. The point is understanding that a process was being affected, that altering the process in a business is a major act, and that to understand that, to understand why that is, we need to, oh, I'm going to run way late. I'm sorry. I'm nearly there. To understand that, we need to talk about a key concept, namely that all technology is political. And I know there's a lot of conversation on the internet that says, no, it's not. Politics and technology are clearly disconnected. <laughs> clearly. And they are wrong. <laughs> Fundamentally. <laughs> Fundamentally and completely wrong. Because I want to talk to you about Conway's Law, which, if you haven't heard of it, says organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of those organizations. What this tells us is that technology is politics because technology encodes the organization that made it. That's all politics is, really, how we do stuff, how we talk to each other, how we communicate and work with our shared values. From this, we can look at technologies and we'll see one of two things. Either we'll see something that makes no sense. Why would anyone want to do these things this way? Look how bad it is in all of these ways. No, really, this is terrible. Hold on, hold on. I'm going to write a think piece on Medium about how bad of an idea this is. And this is because the technology does not align with the politics that we hold. It is the result of a Conway's law from an organization with different beliefs, with assumptions and axioms and ideas that are different to our own. Alternatively, we might see a technology that is so mind-blowingly correct. I wish I'd brought Galaxy Brain. Oh, so immensely appropriate. Something that can solve all of our problems. Such product, very complete. Wow. And this is because that technology does have politics that align with our own. It is the result of Conway's law from an organization that operates not identically, but close enough. And we'll see one of those two worldviews. So what's a great example of this in action? Well, I've touched on it already. What about Docker? Docker's a great example of this. Who thought Docker was a terrible idea? Who later thought Docker was a great idea? 
I've gone through that process. I came up with a layer theory of DevOps as a result of that process. I didn't learn more about technology to do that process. I merely internalized a new set of political assumptions, ones that matched those of the uh, maintainers of Docker. This is why microservices isn't a technological pattern. It's a team organization pattern. It's a political pattern. It's trying to use a product of Conway's law that may be orthogonal to our existing politics. And this, this is why it's been 13 years and five months and 16 or possibly 17 days since the cloud launched. And we're still talking about it as some kind of new thing. It is incompatible with the considerations and axioms and political landscape of so many businesses. And this is relevant because what we think we do is work on technology. And what we need to do is understand the political ramifications of technology and how that impacts the businesses that we work in. And what we actually do, what we actually do is ignore that need. But without that understanding, without those considerations, we will continue to be frustrated. Those conversations will continue to be difficult, so that we will be resentful and we will struggle. I'm almost done. <laughs> then you will get to go have morning tea, so it'll be about five more minutes. Thank you all for your patience. So I've talked a lot about why we need to talk to businesses and the assumptions that businesses are carrying when we come into those conversations and how what we're saying isn't working. But I haven't talked about anything about how to say different things, about new ways to think about how we engage with process and communicate the risks and values and benefits of those changes. So let's talk a little bit about how I pitch DevOps to businesses, because DevOps isn't a technology. It's never been about technology. Instead, DevOps is a political artifact. Technology enabled DevOps because all technology is political and it required a new worldview from its adopters. So when we talk about DevOps, when we talk about these changes, we need to learn to talk about politics. And to talk about politics, well, the first thing that I talk about when I'm talking about DevOps to a business is asking what the org chart is. And they'll give me a thing that looks kind of like this. And then I'll ask, no, 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 no. What is the real org chart look like? And often there will be some confusion. I don't have a slide, a nice slide for it. But the real org chart, the real power in an organization isn't who tells whom what to do, but who owns deadlines? Who owns the deadlines? And that's an important question. Who owns the deadlines? Because you can't change a process without the ability to try the new process. And that seems obvious, right? This, if we don't have time to try, we don't have time to try. Tautologies. But what's not obvious is that when things catch fire, the easiest path is always to go back to the old process, to the known process, the one that offers believable estimates, a process that could say it will take a week to definitely fix, or a month to definitely ship. And I can come along and say, well, the new process might take an hour to ship or it might take three months. That might? I don't need might, I need to know. Thank you, right now. You, guarantee it. Guarantee it will take an hour. We can't do that. And this isn't just outages or things being on fire. This applies to shipping deadlines, to meeting shipping deadlines, to getting product to market. And without that space to explore and experiment, without that ability to alter deadlines, we can't change the politics. The second major thing I pitch is ways to stop being so insular. We are so really very terrible at this because we bear the burden of history being terrible and insulting and caustic to people who aren't us. But we must go and figure out who will be affected by our proposed changes. And we need to ask them about their concerns and their needs. And we need to do it while understanding that they will be defensive. They will expect us to make their lives worse. And not just a little bit worse, a lot worse. And we will have to keep managing it over and over every day because they will not come to us unless they are forced to. They have no reason to do so. And I'd like to tell a little story that I heard at KiwiCon. And it's not my story. 
This is the story from Etsy and how they worked to get InfoSec, and they were having a problem with InfoSec, into a place where it could be more effective as a team. And the InfoSec team started out in the corner, as many technical teams do, and they, in that very much stereotypical mindset of hissing at the light of intruders, and this clearly wasn't working. They were seeing a lot of security events that were concerning. When an event happened, it wouldn't get reported. People expected to be shouted at or belittled if they brought something up to InfoSec. That's contempt culture. And this is clearly not sustainable. Good InfoSec is a huge deal. So what Etsy did was they moved the InfoSec team, like physically moved them out from the dark corner into the middle of the office so that everyone going anywhere had to walk by them. They stopped hiring the caustic people. They fired the really egregious ones. And, and this was the part that I thought was really interesting, was the InfoSec people put out a jar of lollies on a scale. And they said, anyone can have one. Just come by, pick up a lolly, it's fine. And they measured, as one does, the correlation between the number of security events and the weight of the lollies in the jar. <laughs> And they saw the number of, of events decrease the fewer lollies were in the jar. So they reasoned, they hypothesized that the reason was people were passing by and taking some candy and stopping to have a chat. And because they had worked on their culture, the InfoSec team was able to start talking friend in a friendly way, starting to share good InfoSec practice to make it not terrifying to come and speak with them in the, in, when something bad happened because they made the conversation safe. I keep seeing that lady's wonderful earrings, I think, and they're awesome, go you. People at Etsy had to be given a reason to talk to the InfoSec team. The team had to change how they communicated, what they communicated, and why they were communicating it. And by managing that relationship, by learning to manage our relationships to the business, we can start being involved in the conversations where we need to be involved. We can start to offer improvements on other people's lives and processes and needs and dismantle the idea that we are going to say no or make their lives infinitely harder or actually be really, really not great in front of clients because that happens. As I've touched on so much, we don't speak business very well. And I can't teach you how to do it. There's lots of books on the subject and you need to learn to do it. This will be in financial terms. But more than that, it will be in terms of risk and benefit and understanding how they need to hear about risks and benefits. This will require writing roadmaps, considering what's important today and what can wait and why it can wait. You'll need to answer, learn, to answer, learn to ask questions like, what level of risk are you willing to adopt here? And one of the questions that I ask when doing disaster recovery planning with my clients is, how much data are you willing to lose? Is it a week's worth of data? A day? An hour? Half an hour? Nothing? Nothing is impossible, but this tells us how much DR automation we need, what level of backups we need. I can also ask, how long is it okay for you to be offline? And then we can get our number of nines. And do most businesses need five nines of uptime? Probably not. Do they need two nines of uptime? Probably not. And if not, why are we building to that level? And as part of writing these roadmaps, I'm really close to done. Writing these roadmaps, you should also be, consider be considering that there is no such thing as a perfect implementation. There's just what meets our needs today and what we can hopefully expand to meet, to meet our needs later. And again, you'd think this would be obvious, but I hear all the time, and you've probably heard it too, and you've probably said it, because I know I have. Oh, but we built this wrong, and if we'd just done it right in the beginning. Surprise! You couldn't. It wasn't possible. There's just what you can do at the time how you can adapt to what you will need now, and how to make it maybe possible to change to what you need in the future. But uh, surprise, you'll be wrong about that too. So please, if we could just get, if one thing, one thing you take from this is stop saying if we'd just done it right, 
the world will be infinitely better because it is a part of that caustic and insulting and critical and contemptuous worldview, that caustic um, language. It denigrates everything that came before. It tells us that anyone who did work that wasn't our work had no idea what they were doing. It ignores, completely ignores, the context and constraints and limitations of their work. The final thing, the very final thing, all of this leans on empathy, on recognizing that other people have different needs and goals and pressures and priorities, and that you, as technologists, need to participate in that. And that's all DevOps is, really. I've just spent 50 minutes telling you that it's be empathetic to other technical teams, meeting the needs of others. But DevOps isn't just technical teams. It's the entire organization, and we, you and I and everyone you meet are a part of making that change. We are growing that way as a culture. We all need to be a part of it. Linus stepped down. He said, actually, everything I've done was bad. I'm going to try to change. And that, my dear friends, is what I've learned from talking to your boss, that we must listen and understand and empathize that we must discard broken and internally inconsistent ideas like merit or done right. And by doing this, we can achieve new goals and build a better future for everyone. Thank you. I hope you, am I still alive? Yes. I hope you all have a great PyCon. I will be taking questions in the hallway track. Am I live? Am I live? Yes. If you signed up to be a session chair, please come to the front right now. Otherwise, everyone else, feed, be merry. Have a wonderful PyCon.